Shka Ghurnik Babchugi Vishak Bayak Mirotam Safai Mashma. Good day, relatives. Um, you're supposed to say something in response. <laughs> Make sure you're awake. So, before I go any further, uh, it is always customary for our people, the Oatam, and I want to thank my brother here for trying not to butcher it too bad, <laughs> but he did good. I am uh, Akamir Oatam, uh, the river people from uh, Gila River Indian community. We don't call it that. Spanish named the river um, Gila. But in our language, some of you may, and I'll show, I got a lot of pictures and a lot of slides, so I don't want to take up too much time. I'm sure there's a lot of folks that uh, have some great information. And mine uh, presentation uh, is somewhat uh, a collection of the media within the United States and then uh, what has proceeded before that and how things took place. Uh, but I want to first of all acknowledge the Darawa people and the Wadi Wadi and all the other indigenous peoples of these territories whose ancestral DNA is in the trees and the land and in the water. It is very important for us to be uh, recognizing that despite all this electricity and all these other uh, modern um, accommodations that we have. Uh, we are indigenous peoples, we are people of the land, we are people of the territory, and we are warriors who remain that. And we will never um, stop giving up that fight for the rights of Mother Earth. And we need to recognize that today as not only uh, indigenous peoples, but non-indigenous peoples. Because what happens to me happens to you. It'll eventually come in full cycle, uh, in a cycle. Um, the recognition of the Oatham uh, is very important where I'm from. Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the United States, and it's about, about four million people in the city, I would imagine. But, so, as you can imagine, we have a lot of non-Indian people in our territory. And with that, there's a, a lot of encroachment in our territories. The depletion of water, and we live in a desert. Some of you guys were complaining about the heat. <laughs> no. I'm wearing a jacket. Uh, some of you were dying on our way over here. I'm like, please, this is nothing. Uh, so, um, I always start out with this presentation or this, film, this slide here. Can you see that, guys? Yep. So this particular information comes from the United Nations. And I'll get a little bit into my work at the UN but, and how I got involved in that. But the impacts of capitalism, colonization, and forced assimilation into uh, to indigenous peoples happens all over the world, specifically those from the British, uh, Portuguese, and the Europeans. Um, and I want you to look at that last particular slide, even though all of these bullet points are extremely important. Poverty, unemployment, and hunger are the highest among in indigenous communities. Hunger is not because of the lack of food, but because of the land and crops and the water and the access to water. And at the bottom I put the Oatam and the Maya of Guatemala. The Maya in, in, in a lot of our work when we do go to areas of difficulty um, uh, Maya, the Mayan uprising and the battle that just recently took place uh, where thousands of indigenous Mayans were murdered in the 50s and all the way through the 70s and still continues to this day. 98% of the land is owned by non-indigenous peoples, 98%. And the people, the Mayan people that do have access to fields, there's still extreme poverty there, uh, high poverty. The Oatham, my people, water was dammed up by President Roosevelt and Coolidge back in the 1900s. What ensued, and I'm not going to stick on the, 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 even though indigenous history and stories are extremely difficult and uh, we have a lot of sad stories, uh, 
Um, I, I'm a warrior. I don't put my head down for anybody. But, but, um, but the people, my autumn, the people that, uh, where I come from, suffer the highest diabetes rate anywhere in the world, in the world. We die at a, high, at a, at a very young age. Uh, because of our water was taken uh, by these presidents that are recognized in the U.S. school systems and recognized as important people in the education system, they killed thousands of our people. I want to talk just quickly about these two flags here. I was asked by Bronwyn to bring uh, some flags of my people. The first flag, and, and this one should be probably on top, um, but the first flag is the flag of Abi Ayala. What is recognized in Turtle Island and Abi Ayala, what they call America, we call Turtle Island. What the indigenous peoples of Mexico and all the way down south into Tierra del Fuego in Argentina, we recognize as Abi Ayala. Mother Earth. We are connected. We don't recognize borders. We don't recognize colonial borders. Uh, when people, when I cross the border, this man-made border between Mexico and the United States, they ask me if I'm an American and I speak to them in my language and they look at me strange and they ask me where I'm from and I tell them, oh, at Tamjovat. They say, where is that? I say, you're standing on it. But the Department of Homeland Security, the Border Patrol, and I'm sure you guys heard all these great stories about America and, and its immigration policies, has uh, devastated our community. But these flags here, this flag in particular, is one that was given to our people some time back. And we carry that flag where we go. So that we recognize that we are people that are connected. We are one people. The other flag that sits on top is the American Indian Movement flag. I grew up in the, I was born in the 60s, and um, I was truly had the opportunity to be around many warriors, many of our warriors that I'll show you in some of our photographs. There's always been um, roots of resistance, always. This is what, America used to look like. There are hundreds and hundreds of nations. I'm way down here. And so this is what you see today. That's where we're at. So all of that has been taken. We don't have we have reservations. Remember, reservations are prisoners of war camps. That's what they are. They all have numbers. Uh, we, though the Oatham were very uh, powerful and wonderful, amazing people, um, and we assisted the early settlers, they, like our brothers, the Pequots to the east, and the Narragansett, and the Massantucket, were devastated by the 1800s and the early 1900s. So that is where we're at today in America. This is what they teach in the United States. The Mugion, the Anasazi, and the Huogam, or Hohoka. But if I go back to this frame, what do you see? You see not this big lump of people who are um, the Apache or, or you know, the Pueblo, the Comanche. We go back down to this slide. You see they, how they define this border here? Our traditional territory runs about 800 miles into Sonora, Mexico. 800 miles. Every day I've been trying to wake up and run and just go for a hike. And I, I think I was talking to Bronwyn or her husband and he goes, run? What do you mean run? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what the hell are you doing, man? <laughs> Our people traditionally are runners 
and we would run down to this place here, what they now call the Gulf of California, to gather salt, sea salt. And it was a, it was a trade that we did. That is our territory, traditional territories. We, my, we, I am a descendant of the Huogong. Those are my ancestors. They date back in that region about 8,000 years. There has always been, and that is just another picture of our Hajin, our relatives in Mexico. They speak the same language I do. Uh, we go down there and they're about 800 miles away. And if I were to tell you the creation story or migration story, that will take a long time and we don't have all day. Um, but that is where a lot of our relatives are from. Why am I here? I don't know why I came to Australia. <laughs> it's a beautiful country, man. The plane ride killed me. <laughs> but I love it. Beautiful. I was able to walk along the beach with my, friend, my new friend, Michelle. I appreciate her giving me all the information. I've been asking a lot of questions. All of them, we are very curious. We want to know about who you are, how you existed, and how you exist today. Why is it important? I'm here, hopefully, to inform, to create consciousness, and to reveal of who we are as all of them, because you yourself are an all of them. All of them means a human being. That's who you are. And I hope that you take a position today. And that I hope that you be I hope that you begin to dismantle what's been set in place. That's the hard thing to do. The American Indian movement was began because people, indigenous peoples in North America in the 60s and the 70s, they felt like they had no other choice but to stand up. And those were my uncles and my warriors and my relatives, my brothers and my sisters. When I was young, a lot of people were dying in our communities, a lot of men, young men. Media rarely covered that. Media never talked about it. In fact, you were lucky to get maybe a few words of who died in the newspaper. So there have always been forms of resistance. In my community today, we have a poverty, a poverty level of about 40%, despite all the casinos that are out there. And I, and I want to dispel that myth. Many of us, especially Americans, I know I'm in a whole different country, but it's a myth that, oh, American Indians are getting rich off casinos. That's not true. We have over 400 years of colonization that we still deal with today. Today. You're not just talking you think money's going to help like our brother here said, oh, put some money in my little account. That ain't going to help you. It may help the cause temporarily. It is a long-term struggle for indigenous peoples to come out of that hole of colonization and poverty. 10% of people in Arizona live below the poverty level. 75% of the 21 reservations in the state of Arizona live below the poverty level. All of them. That's a lot. That's a lot. Anybody tell me where this, I mean, you guys see it, where it comes from, but what do you recognize in this picture? Anybody? Quickly, what's the first thing that you see, brother? A soldier no longer in the country. What else? That's not what I'm looking for. What? They're both indigenous. Somebody was talking about Hawaii and how the police are Hawaiian. When the North American Free Trade Agreement hit Chiapas and went down into Mexico, devastating their economy, the resistance kicked up. And today, the Maya of Chiapas still maintain that land as sovereignty and recognized as sovereign nation. They are an armed resistance a physical armed resistance, and they maintain that territory. They are warriors, truly, and they maintain that. If they can do it, I think we can do it, but I'm not saying to arm yourself because probably most of you can't even shoot a gun. 
and probably scare you. Where I come from, guns are a dime a dozen. They cross the border like bubble gum and corn. Sadly, that's the unfortunate truth. There has always been forms of resistance, but you never see it in the media of the United States. Never. It's, if it is, then it's talked about as those troublemakers, those guys who always want to fight, the American Indian movement who still believes in the past. These guys have always been, we have a lot of pride in our, in our indigenous peoples. Tecumseh, he was a warrior, largest indigenous army in the 1700s that fought against, that fought against the Americans. Later the Brits turned against him. You know how that goes. The second guy, Chief Joseph, the beautiful earrings. You guys know him as Chief Joseph. We don't call him that. A lot of names that you're going to learn today. Goyatla, one of the greatest warriors of our time. Both of these men. Geronimo is who you call Geronimo. Tatanka Iotanka, Sitting Bull. Great warriors of our time. My brother Russell Means. The American Indian Movement. Anybody know where this picture comes from? I know I'm in Australia, but anybody? He was testifying in front of Congress. And guess who was sitting on the seat at Congress? Our good friend John McCain. If you know anything about John McCain and his politics, his world politics, they're pretty devastating. Always calling for war, always calling for somebody to be relocated always calling for another dead soldier. That's what John McCain does. Ask an Indian, he'll tell you. Talk to us and we'll tell you the truth. That's what happens. Russell Means is testifying in front of Congress and belittles Congress. And you see Congress or the Senate of Indian Affairs sitting there looking irritated and pissed off that this guy with the long hair and braids is telling them that they're immigrants. They're pissed off. These two people, Thomas Binyaka, who I knew, all these people in these pictures I know or knew. Thomas Binyaka, Hopi, the house of Micah, he gave a speech at the UN and he told them that it's going to rain and it began to rain and it flooded out the basement of the UN. Nobody believed him and it rained and it rained and they had to shut down the UN. Pretty amazing story. This lady, Pauline, uh, Pauline Whitesinger from Big Mountain in Arizona, one of our warriors, the US government started putting up fences. Did you hear about this in the media? No, no. They started relocating Navajos, thousands of them, because guess who? John McCain, Peabody Cole, wanted to move them out of the land. Peabody Cole and all the mining companies that exist there along Navajo Nation and along the Four Corners area of the United States. Pauline Weisinger saw these fences and started pulling them down at her age. She called for all us young warriors to come and help and we went. We weren't afraid and we're not afraid. This is not about Shannon Rivers waving his flag and standing on top of a hill claiming that he's a tough warrior. It is about a resistance that's still maintained by our people. Our people are strong people. We will not and cannot lose our language and our ceremonies. That's what ties us. Do you hear about that in the media? No. This march I led along with thousands of other people. This was the largest march in the history of the state of Arizona about SB 1070 and immigration law that was trying to be passed by the state of Arizona. A hundred thousand people marched that day. A hundred thousand, ninety to a hundred thousand people. On the news that night, my daughter says, Dad, Dad, they're going to show the news. The lady comes on, beautiful newscaster, tight dress, a lot of makeup. She stands there and says, there was a march today in downtown Phoenix. Tom, what does the weather look like? 
100,000 people in the state of Arizona. That's the kind of media that we get. There's a monopoly. And I see that here, and I was, somebody was talking about uh, the Canadian, uh, or no, I'm sorry, in the Australian media. The same stuff. We're boring, TV's boring, right? But there's a monopoly. And we constantly watch the same thing. My uncle has a shirt. He says, it's six o'clock news. The six o'clock news is on, let me tell you what to think. <laughs> I love that shirt, by the way. And there's this monopoly that takes place and it concentrates on stories that are the feel-good stories, right? I was telling my friend Michelle, I said, if you want a flute-playing, feather-wearing, dancing Indian on the stage, I ain't the brother. That ain't me. Not saying there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't do that. My job is to inform, to collect information, and to share it with our people who are uninformed. I'm not here to, to sit in, bun, in front of a bunch of PhDs, candidates. I'm here to educate people and to talk about issues that continue to plague our communities. America has this monopoly and it, and it controls literally everything. What you guys see in America, like the ignorant folks like Donald Trump and all these other candidates, that's, sadly, that's America. How does somebody like that get on TV? The other, today I was telling our friends here that I was watching a basketball game and this black player here in Wollongong fell and slipped. And this guy, a white man, poured beer on him. I saw that this morning, today. Where I'm from, I don't know, it'd be a fight. It will be a fight. But racism, whether subtle or direct, is something that seems to be given and allowed by white privilege. That consistently happens every day in America. All these companies make millions and millions of dollars. Millions. America's mass media, all this, I saw this Dancing with the Stars thing news last night and some Australian girl won, right? I'm sorry, I mean, I, I'm sure you all like her. I'm sure she's great. But my point is it's American controlled media. Yeah, 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 yeah. So all this, yeah. Bindi, yeah, there you go. That was her name, Bindi. I apologize for you Australians. <laughs> but the reality is, is this is what happens every day when someone turns on the TV and guess what? My people are just as vulnerable. They're always saying, well, let's buy a TV. Why? What does that purpose do? And, I, and for those of you that are in, in, in Facebook and I mean, I got a Facebook, I don't post that much, but, but these guys, people like, like, like. It's silly to me, but you know, whatever. I, I like to physically go out there and try to stand that line, right? And there's a lot of warriors behind us that do that. And I love those guys, right? They're my warriors. They're the people that, um, that stand up for that. I don't know how I am on time. Okay. So, again, CBS, NBC, uh, ABC, Walt Disney Corp, Corporation, all of these guys control a lot of what you see. And I, I would imagine it's the same thing here. When I was in Europe, it's the same thing I saw. Same format, same technique, same discussion, same stuff. So... In the United States, there's this big deal. Anybody hear about the Keystone Pipeline? It's been shut down? All right. By the efforts of 
Facebook, Twitter, social media, a lot of gatherings. They were doing uh, uh, drum circles in malls, shutting things down, right? Young folks gathering, gathering, coming together. And so in the United States, but it's interesting how that started to play in the more of the, the common media, the mass media, was that it was always a white person talking about it. Bill from 350.org, Bill McKinnon, right? Bill McKinnon is a great guy, I'm sure, but he was always the guy that was talking, right? Always. You didn't, you didn't hear about the indigenous peoples who took up uh, to claim the land, reclaim the land and put up teepees and ceremonial huts and traditional uh, homes there in the path of Keystone Pipeline. You didn't hear about that. You heard about it on Facebook and other indigenous uh, outlets, medias, but not ABC, NBC, CNN, or Fox. And if you did hear about it on Fox, it was always negative. Oh, those damn Indians. Well, of course they didn't say that, but basically that's what they're saying. You know. I know uh, Bronwyn and I were talking, we were laughing about how uh, Native people are sometimes portrayed, and, and a friend of mine uh, at NAU, um, she asked us to Google the, the word uh, Native American or American Indian, and what pops up is old imagery. It's never imagery of today. The Shannon Rivers, or my uncles, or people who are at Keystone, or whoever. Never. It's always imagery of the past, the brothers with the feathers. Those are amazing warriors. There are people. We love and we take pride in them. But if you Google that today, you'll, that's what you'll see, 90% of those pictures of the 1800s and the 1700s, images like that. So we're still isolated and very much uh, from the media. And our discussions are never about the human rights. And the word genocide, I wanted to, it's never talked about. In fact, the UN, when we started doing some work at the UN, the term genocide was very, very uh, difficult to place in the documents at the UN. They'll recognize the Jewish Holocaust. They'll recognize barely the Armenian Holocaust, barely the Rwandan Holocaust and genocide. But when you talk about American Indian Holocaust genocide. Don't say that, Shannon. Don't, that's not what happened. And I remind you that there are many different forms of genocide. It is not just the killing, the blatant killing of thousands or hundreds of people. It is an ongoing process of genocide. The language, the culture, ceremonies, the taking of the land, the raping of the land of Mother Earth. There are many forms of genocide. And you never hear these terms written and discussed in mass media in the United States. Never. You will not. It is something that people stay away from. Much less will you hear anything about treaties. Never about treaties. There are mass treaties. I mean, we're, we're a treaty nation, right? And you never hear anything about that. There's always that misrepresentation of indigenous peoples. And sometimes, periodically, they'll get that nice, good Indian guy, and they'll bring him, and he'll come up and do a blessing. I don't do blessings. I don't bless McDonald's or a new building. <laughs> I don't do that. And I, and, I, and I tell my people, let's stop doing that. Because they'll invite you, but you're not going to have a seat at the table. You're usually on the menu. <laughs> right? You're usually on the menu. And we get eaten alive if we're not on the menu. And the process at the United Nations is, believe me, it's not, it's not a walk in the park. You got member states who have high interest. United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, 
the people who refused to sign the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and still barely recognize any rights of Indigenous Peoples. We're on the menu, folks. Believe me, we are. Um, just more stuff. This here I want you to, to look at. Somebody read that for me, M for me. Loud. Everybody participate, wake up. Indigenous activism might, seem, might see some media coverage is contextualized within civil rights issues, such as voting, struggle over becoming American. Right. So, I, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of tough, right? I mean, we, uh, there's a lot of pride in our folks who have served the military, right? A lot of pride. Flag waving, you know, pin wearing. That's tough for us, right? It's a tough thing. I mean, you hear about the Navajo code talkers, the Comanche code talkers, Ira Hayes, you know, all these wonderful, wonderful human beings. We were talking last night uh, with my friends here in, about the Black Panther movement and the American Indian movement. And at the time um, of the movements and the things that were taking place, indigenous peoples weren't fighting for voter, voting rights. We were fighting for treaty rights, territorial rights, land rights, water rights, and basic health care. The Black Panther movement had that discussion also, but they also were looking for civil rights. We believe that our rights trump those rights because we were original peoples of the territories and we had treaties that proved the negotiations that took place with two nations, equal nations. But we struggle with that today. A lot of us are really caught up in this uh, media, right, every day. We're, we're turning on the TV, we're flipping up on our phones. I was trying to look for something on my phone. Of course, I don't have access to nothing here. Um, my mom calls me almost every day just checking in, so she's probably freaking out. But, um, but, but, but what I'm saying is that any quality of media coverage is always poor, extremely poor. And the image that I use of our, my brother Russell um, was always, he was always portrayed as the angry guy. Russell means, ooh, you know. He has a book called white, Where White Men Fear, Fear to Tread. Check it out. It's a kind of cool title. But he was always portrayed as the angry guy. But when I was sitting with Russell, whether it was at dinner or whether it was the UN or whether we were just <laughs> chilling out, we laughed about everything. It was a great conversation. I didn't know him like that. But once he stepped into that circle to protect the people, the spirit came behind him and told him, stand strong and proud. And that's what we see different. Not an angry person, but someone who is prideful and has that recognition of the tradition and the spirits behind them. As I mentioned earlier, the American media coverage always talks and covers, oh, it's Thanksgiving. I think today's Thanksgiving in the United yeah. States. Yeah, damn it, somebody better get me a turkey. Um, so they're always covering stuff like that, right? And it's always the good stuff. Make me feel good. Make me feel okay about my thievery, about my taking of the land, of my, my killing of all these people. Never is it discussed in the, believe me, it's not. Um, I wanted to, I think, this particular, I wanted to get to the bottom one there. The top rating story by the New York Times was the res. The reservation is what we call it, the res, right? People say, let's go to the res. I think out here you say, let's go to the outback. I don't know what you say, but the mish, the mish, the mish, 
or the bush, I think I kept hearing. Yeah. But the top rating story was about the res, and it was always a negative story, right? Always. The violence, the health problems, drugs and alcohol and violence, right? The top rating story. But look at that date of 2002, right? That's old. I had friends of mine who work in media today to look for stories that have changed. And he said, you know what, there's really nothing out here, man. What does that tell you? 13 years later, the stories are still basically the same. Indian Country Today is a newspaper, a very wide newspaper, and I, 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 don't, I, I don't always agree with what they write, but it's one of the biggest newspapers in our country that serves Indian Country. And it's a good newspaper. I mean, it, it has a lot of our information on it. Powwows, events, discussions on the pipeline, um, occupying uh, folks in certain er uh, territories. But that particular story was the top rated one. And then we moved to the second one, the casinos I mentioned. <laughs> right? There are 560 recognized tribes in the United States. Something like that. Federally recognized that I know Hawaii is having this discussion now. I was just interviewed for that. But of all those 500 tribes, not all of them have casinos. And not all of them, all those tribes are near major metropolitan areas. So a lot of them barely make any money. They're isolated, like in the Pine Ridge Reservation, Wind River Casino, in the middle of nowhere. Truckers don't have a lot of money to gamble. They're looking just to crash the night in the hotel. Those are some of the stories. Third ranking story was the mascot issue. The mascot. Washington Redskins, or the R word as we term it. Oh, when you talk about sports teams in America, and if you have any neg anything negative to say, uh, there's going to be a fight. And America, boy, they love their teams. It doesn't matter that their, their name is derived from the killing of indigenous peoples and the taking of their scalp. That's what the term redskin means. It was a bounty on our people to cut their hair and get their scalp. And the more young, younger you were as a warrior, your scalp was a lot more money. Kill the children, the elders, not so much. They're going to die anyway. Get the warriors, get the young folks. The word Washington or the word redskin is where that, word, that comes from. We don't like that word, we don't use it. On the back of my truck, a friend of mine gave me a bumper sticker that says, love the team, hate the name, change it, right? It should be changed, but this is America, it's hard to change anything, it's very tough. Individual monies. Oh, those Indians, right? Everything has to do with monies and handouts. The casinos, the money, individual monies. I think my mom did receive some money and she got $2,000. $2,000. That's nothing. For 50 years of litigation for the individual Indian monies, the Cobell case, that's what this is. Look it up, it's, it's there. And then finally, cultural expression. Let's talk about Indians. Let's talk about them in a good way. Oh, there's a powwow in downtown Tempe today. Oh, there was some beautiful, you know, the tourists come to Arizona and they want to see an Indian. Where are the Indians at? You know? <laughs> We're like the cactus, man. We just stand there and look at them like. <laughs> This is tough stuff, man. This is horrible. This is what we deal with in the country of America. This is what we deal with. It's a mess. It's a mess. People go, oh, I want to go to America. Well, yeah, come on over. But remember, you're coming to our territories of traditional people. And there are many of us that still, we love our land. People say, well, why don't you, you know, on our, that big march that we, I showed you the picture of? 
we had guys, white supremacists, white folks, yelling at us, telling us to go back where we came from. <laughs> We're like, yeah, well, I can't really go that far, you know. So one of our guys, Aaron Huey, wrote this. And it says that the last chapter of any successful genocide is the one which the oppressor can remove his hands and say, my God, what are these people doing to themselves? They're killing each other. They're killing themselves while we watch them die. This is how we came to own these United States. This is the legacy of manifest destiny. That's America, folks. Whether you like it or not, we want you to come, but recognize that indigenous peoples are there. And that's how the United States became how it is. The idea of manifest destiny. The United Nations once, they, in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I usually try to carry this book because I think it's important. Many folks will say, ah, it's the United Nations. It's, it's not, yeah. It's the UN. It's a whole system. Right, of course. But nearly every court case that we fight in the United States, whether it's through Ninth Circuit Court or the Supreme Court, we lose. Because they have title, right to title to the land. The doctrines of discovery has given that. And the doctrines of discovery in the papal bull of 1493 by, Alec, uh, by Pope Alexander at the time wrote that anyone who is a Saracen, pagan, and non-Christian were deemed non-human. That's the legal framework in which the United States is based on. From that case to the Cherokee Long Walk case, Johnson v. McIntosh, to the case of San Francisco Peaks, to the cases of all these litigations that take place. It is a very a difficult thing. Article 16 in the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I'm not going to read, but it in in brief, it says that indigenous peoples have the right to their own media, their own media, and their own media outlets, and their own stories that come from these people, that come from the people. You have the right to free prior and informed consent. Utilize it. It's important. Recognize who you are as indigenous peoples. In America, do we resist or do we accept? President Obama, I wish him luck in this deeply rooted system of capitalism and manifest destiny. I wish him luck. A lot of our Indian people like him. I'm sure he's a nice guy. I never met him. I've been in meetings with his staff, but never met him. So do we resist? Do we continually fight? Or do we accept? And most people will argue, ah, you guys are already colonized. You're speaking English. You're traveling. You're doing lectures. Whether you're going to Peru or Guatemala or Mexico or Canada or Australia. Where do you stand? I don't know. That is not my question to answer. I know where I stand and where I remain in the position as a fighter for the rights of indigenous peoples, those inherent rights of my people. That's who we are as Oato. Before I go, I want to give our brothers and sisters a little medicine here. It comes from my people. In our language, we call it shugoi, and if Brown would get off her Twitter account. <laughs> my sister here, I met some time back, and I appreciate you inviting me here. And I said, I'm, you know, I'm not a PhD. I'm not a, you know, I don't do any of that stuff. I work with men who have harmed other people. 
and serving long-term sentences that will never get out. That's what I do. And if they do get out, I want them to look me up. And they have. And I love these men. These are warriors. They weren't once warriors, they are warriors. They remain warriors. Despite that they're caged up every day, despite that they struggle to find sanity in an insane place, they are gonna get out. And I tell them that you're free already. These bars and these chains and these fences, they don't hold you back. Be free in your spirit, in your tradition, in your ceremony. Because despite all that happened to us, we're still here. So I want to give this to you, sister, and thank you for uh, inviting me here to this beautiful land of yours. So, mm. Thank you very much. My name is Nisha. Thank you for sharing what you have with us. Um, I was hoping you could comment a little more on um, whether the UNDRIP, uh, the two nations, the indigenous nations in Arizona that have adopted it. My nations, yeah. Gila River, Gila. Gila River mm -hmm. and Copper, sorry. Yeah. Um, has that made a difference? And I was also wondering about incarcerated First Nations people. Sure. Has anything changed? So um, my brother, and I have to recognize my brother uh, Tupac Enrique Acrosta, who is uh, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, director of uh, Tona Tierra. It's an indigenous Oregon embassy in our territory, in Oatham territory. Uh, we approached the nations, the tribes at the time, and uh, we were at the UN and uh, getting into uh, this uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has been a long, ongoing process, 30-something years. Um, and we approached our nations about the recognition of the declaration. And if, if you got anyone need to see that, I can pass it around. But... Um, but specifically, we were talking about territorial issues, about with the Oatham. Because as I, as I showed you, we cross into the, our territories cross into the border. And we were thrust into that because of 9-11. Uh, when 9-11 took place, then uh, the encroachment of the Department of Homeland Security and the Border Patrol just expanded like crazy. So now we have over 100,000 vehicles crossing or roaming that border, um, the Arizona, California, and Texas border, just thousands of vehicles disrupting uh, ceremonial crossings or uh, traditional gathering places or um, has it made a difference? The United States is still way behind on that. And the, and the nations themselves have to take um, uh, a larger stance when it comes to that and, and utilizing that decora declaration to their advantage. Um, but I think the problem with uh, federal recognition is that you're still under the umbrella of the United States and then you're then subjugated to their uh, rules and laws and policies. And so, and after 9-11 happened, I think over a hundred plus bills were passed in the House and in the Senate that impacted most Americans or all Americans and Americans didn't even know that took place because they were passing bills. And specifically some of them were that the Department of Homeland Security could go within 100 miles of the Canadian-Mexico border and, and, and enter your home without question if you were, uh, uh, if you were thought to have um, uh, harboring any immigrants, which, of course, we all know that some poor Mexican brother crossing the border with a plastic bag with, with, with his clothes is here to do damage to the United States. Give me a break. That's not happening. Uh, the terrorists did not come through uh, our territory. They flew into America and were here for quite a while, if that's what happened. I mean, there's controversy about that, too. I'm just saying it's, it's very difficult. With regards to the men uh, in prison, and which is sadly, at one of the prisons I work with, I have over 2,000 Hawaiians uh, in that particular prison at, with CCA, uh, Corrections Corporations of America, which is just... Um, um, is basically a housing unit, and that's what they do. Um, 
And your question was about the men in prison. So, so with the, well, it goes back before the declaration, but part of the discussion of the declaration and the negotiations were religious freedom and the American Indian Religious Freedom Act was what the American Indian movement was pushing forward at the time and then became law. So indigenous peoples within the prison systems, federal, state, county is a little reluctant, but they, um, they have the rights to religious freedoms and to practice their ceremonies my job is to bring that ceremony to them and that's what i do so any other questions you guys were all happy and smiling what happened so yes um let's start with the young about treaties um because we have a constitutional Here. Here. Mm -hmm. And then, but, but most black fellows, I reckon, uh, we've always talked about treaty. Mm. And we always, I don't know, but we sort of, you know, American has it, <laughs> England has it, yeah. we want it too. Right. And then, but then listening to stuff that happens, <laughs> Sorry. You know, well, yeah. what's the point? Yeah. Like, what, what, what's the point of, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, it, is it worth oh, yeah. we need to keep doing it? So, Treaties have to be accounted, accountable. We have to make those accountable. Those are still legal binding documents within the system of the United States. And all, no matter what, you have treaties with certain indigenous nations. Is it something that you should do? I don't know. We got a lot of reservations out there that are pretty poor. Uh, and we have land, little access to water, little access to great soil, Navajo Nation for one of them. Uh, uranium tail uh, minings that still exist out there. Never been cleaned up. There's been billions of dollars put forward to clean that up. N I think one out of the 200 have been cleaned up. I don't know the number. It's something ridiculous. But you got uranium uh, tailings blowing in the wind all throughout Navajo Nation, destroying that territory. The, the soil is, is, you know, it's not much out there. You can't really do much. Kilo River has no water. We, though we won the water rights settlement with the United States government, President Bush signed it in 2008. Um, we, we have paper water. We don't physically have the water. There's a lot of stuff that you gotta really consider. Weigh the pros and cons, what are they? I'm all for indigenous people having the right to self-govern. That's it. Why are you asking for permission? We still constantly say, can we do this? We're crossing the border and we're doing ceremony. I ain't asking you nothing. That's, that's just what's going to happen. I mean, this is me, though. Believe me, our, some of our folks are a little afraid. I mean, you got Border Patrol with AR-15s and M-16s. Yeah, that's a little scary. They're going to pull you over and threaten you. That's scary. The intimidation factor is high especially to our elders and our young folks. I mean, they're not, they just want to cross the border. Now they don't even cross the border because of that fear. Does, is, American, is America the model of democracy? Ask a native. That's all I'm saying, ask a native. But that, that's, again, that's entirely up to you guys. I, 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 if you're looking at us, as that model, there's a lot of questions to ask. The Declaration on the Rights at, a, at an international body took 30 years to move forward because, because these member states, United States, Africa, China, whoever, said, some of them said, we don't even have indigenous peoples. What? Well, yeah, you do. 380 million indigenous peoples left in the world. They're all over the place. And they are the ones who have the key to environmental sustainability and practices. They are the key. And you want to ignore them because of political or capitalistic ideas? I don't know. That's a question you have to struggle with. We still struggle with that, right? We still struggle with that. The Potashans in uh, Louisiana, 
uh, are looking to get federal recognition and still fighting for that. Hawaiians, again, as I mentioned, are looking to, to do that. Maybe, right. Well, that's, the, that's the, my point, is maybe. But that's up to you guys. So I think I've spoken for quite a while, but any more questions? Maybe one more if that's not. I'll be here. Somebody said they're going to feed me. Yeah. Again, thank you very much.